So uh, my name is Doug Ullman, and it's a privilege to be here with all of you today. And uh, looking forward to a great session. I'm going to spend uh, about 35, 40 minutes talking, and then uh, would love to have questions. Uh, I was asked to remind everybody that for questions, there's a microphone right back here. So uh, if you would uh, go to the microphone to ask a question, that'd be great. Um, it's really an honor to be here, and I want to first thank you for the invitation. Thank everybody at South by Southwest. Um, for putting on such a great showcase and for having it here in Austin. Uh, for those of you who aren't from Austin, uh, welcome. Uh, it's a privilege to have you here, and, uh, and we're going to have some fun. I also want to acknowledge uh, my colleagues who are here, uh, who I'll talk about a little bit later in the presentation, but uh, quite frankly, I have the honor of working with um, some of the best people in the nonprofit industry. And uh, you know, while I have the privilege of standing up here and talking today, any one of them could be up here, and, uh, and they would probably do a, a better job than, uh, than I would. So uh, it's an honor to work with all of you and, and for you all to be here today. Um, so I thought what I'd do is just jump right in. Let's not waste any time and get right to uh, sort of the main uh, crux of what we're going to talk about today. So I was asked to talk about um, resilience. I was asked to talk about. Um, how to survive a crisis, and what is the so-called new normal. As everybody in this room knows, our organization and our brand have gone through quite a stressful period of time over the last few months, and quite honestly, the last few years. And so let's just get into it and, uh, and cut right to it. Take a minute to read some of these tweets. You know, the hardest thing about preparing for today's talk was that there were so many examples like this that I wasn't sure which ones to pick. So many examples of people like Nick Kristoff, of people like Jake Tapper, people who are so-called journalists, who literally were bastardizing our brand. Tweeting things like this day after day after day, every hour, every minute, on and on and on and on. And, and I was reading these things, and imagine if this was happening to your company or your organization, people that you didn't know who were taking to the platforms and airwaves and saying things about your brand, a brand that means so much to so many people, and they were saying it from a place of not having any idea what that brand really stood for, or what that organization actually did. Imagine, imagine getting up every single morning, open up my iPad, and just start reading them, one after another, after another, after another. It was interesting, when I was reading these from journalists, I was reminded of a flight that I was on a couple years ago where I had the privilege of sitting next to Dan Rather. And we struck up a conversation, and uh, Dan obviously spends a lot of time here in Austin, and I just would never forget one thing that Dan Rather said. He said, you know what, the problem with journalism these days is that it's gone from being skeptical to cynical. And he said, when I was training and learning over the years, many decades ago, they trained us to be skeptical. That was our role. But they didn't train us to be cynical. So the stress on our organization, the stress on our, our people, the stress on our mission, getting up day after day after day for months, seeing things like this, was pretty dramatic. And if this wasn't bad enough, this quote ran in the New York Times in 2010, just as all the drama around the cycling world was starting to sort of really bubble up. They are not going to be able to thrive if the person who is the spirit behind it is in trouble. It is just going to devastate them, said Ken Berger, who runs Charity Navigator, one of the watchdog groups in the charity industry. So if, if the journalists weren't enough, an individual who is tasked with the mission of monitoring and evaluating nonprofits uh, was making statements like this. And we didn't know anything about, we didn't know these individuals, we hadn't talked to these individuals, and ultimately they didn't understand the mission of the organization or the meaning of the brand. So this is what we were up against. This is the so-called crisis that was, that was brewing. So before I get into some of the things that, that we did, and let me preface this by saying, this is not supposed to be a lecture where I, where I tell you the answers to solving a crisis. These are simply experiences that we've had and simply examples of those experiences. We are in the midst of this. 
So I don't stand here as someone saying, oh, we've already made it through and everything's great. We are in the turbulent times right now. Every single day we're dealing with this. So um, that's the perspective that this comes from, not from a perspective of we know what works and we can look back in retrospect and, and identify those things. So I hope you understand that. So in order to give you a little context, um, I wanted to talk about sort of how I got to be here today with all of you. Because I think it's important for some of the issues around resiliency and some of the issues around how we've approached navigating our way through this experience. So this picture was taken um, a long time ago, as you <laughs> will, will know. Um, this picture was taken about two years before I heard what one of my mentors and, 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 and great friends referred to as the three most feared words in the English language. He was a gentleman by the name of Hamilton Jordan. He's the youngest chief of staff in the history of the White House. Died of cancer a few years ago after four battles. And Hamilton used to say the three most feared words in the English language are you have cancer. I grew up in a perfect community on the East Coast, had the privilege of playing soccer at Brown University, was in the best shape of my life, and at the age of 19, was told through a series of, really through a series of flukes that had me end up in the emergency room, that had an attending physician ask for an x-ray, that had my family physician ask for a CAT scan, and after this series of one-off things, all unrelated, I was diagnosed with a very rare cancer called chondrosarcoma. And at first I was told that they would remove part of my spine, I'd be lucky to walk. And I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember where I was sitting, I remember where my parents were sitting, I remember what was on the wall behind the doctor as he flipped through a textbook and as he opened to a page and he held it up and he said, it's been confirmed, you have chondrosarcoma. And I don't remember anything else. Imagine, imagine being 19. Imagine, you all know how hard it is to be a young adult. It's hard to be a young adult in general, much less layer in a diagnosis of cancer or another chronic condition or other health condition. You can imagine what a difficult period of time that was. And as I recovered, and as I tried to regain my life and tried to get back to the quote unquote new normal, I realized that there was such a lack of resources for people my age with cancer. Think about it, when you read about cancer, and you read about cancer survivors, or you did back in uh, the late 90s, you would see a picture of a young child, or you'd see a picture of a, an individual in their 60s or 70s. You didn't tend to see young adults experiencing the cancer experience. So we found that there was this huge void I was in the hospital, I had a thoracic cancer, so as a result of that, I was sharing a room with a gentleman who had lung cancer. And he was coughing and basically suffocating all night. And I thought to myself, he's in a totally different position than I am. He may not make it. I'm planning to live a long, healthy life post-diagnosis. And so um, as a result, we'd call organizations and we'd say, what do you offer for young adults with cancer? And they'd say things like, quote, well, young adults don't really get cancer. And I thought, well, that, that seems a bit odd. I thought, well, I have cancer, and I'm looking for support. No one could offer that type of support. And so one night, I was sitting in my dorm room. I called my parents, and I said, we've got to start an organization to help people with cancer, young adults. Help them connect with other young adults who are going through the same experience to make sure they realize they're not all alone. And one thing led to another, and we did start that organization and started operating support groups and education and, and scholarships for people that couldn't pursue higher education because of their financial bills. And it was amazing the amount of young adults who came out of the woodwork and said, yeah, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of a community. I want to be a part of uh, this network. About a year after I started that, I was sitting in my dorm room, 1997. How many people can remember whether they had email in 1997? Do you remember what your email address was? Prodigy, OK, good. Mine was Eudora. Think about it. In 1997, email was something that you did once or twice a week. I mean, it was like. You wrote, you sat down, you wrote more than one word. You actually wrote the whole word. And in 1997, I was sitting in my dorm room and I had started this nonprofit to help young adults and I got an email. And the email said something to the effect of, I read about you, I know you have your own organization, I just experienced cancer myself, I have my own foundation in Austin, Texas. If there's anything I can ever do, let me know. And it was signed by Lance Armstrong. 
And I didn't know who he was. This was 1997. I had never been to Texas. He hadn't won the Tour de France. He hadn't gained any visibility uh, or notoriety. And he reached out. And what that started was a two and a half year communication by email. Basically, once a week, it was like having a pen pal. You would write a letter, they would write back. You'd write a letter, they'd write back. You'd share ideas, share things. And, and it was so low tech, but at the time it was so high tech. Um, and for two and a half years, we emailed back and forth. And finally, he asked if I would consider coming to Austin and helping the foundation develop programs uh, to benefit cancer patients and survivors. And the reason I came to Austin was because of an unprecedented opportunity to do things in a really creative and innovative way. The nonprofit space has not always been the most innovative and creative. Fast forward to today, it is exploding, and, and this week alone highlights that. But I came to Austin because the philosophy of the organization was to listen to the needs of people with cancer and then develop things to fill those voids in the system. And it was an exciting opportunity, and to this day, I am eternally grateful for that opportunity. Because as much as we've been able to achieve, the future is incredibly, incredibly bright. So the organization has always sort of taken on this approach. Do things differently. Most of our board members are entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, people who are willing to take risk. Things that you don't always see in the social sector. People who are willing to go where others have not. And this idea of listening to survivors, this idea that, yes, cancer research is important, but there's so much money and so much attention and so many people already doing that. The missing link was what happens to people today who are diagnosed with the disease. Our mission is to provide support to people affected by cancer now. Keyword being now, today. How do they navigate that journey? How do they navigate everything from the financial aspects to the psychosocial aspects to the clinical aspects to the practical aspects of transportation, childcare, employment? That's what we're about. And that is the path that was, so to speak, less taken. So let me just tell you what we do and then let's get into the, the sort of specifics of how we've managed the last few months. We provide free one-on-one -on -one support to people affected by cancer. Doesn't matter what type of cancer. Doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter how much money you have, doesn't matter whether you have insurance. You can call and someone will answer the phone, one of our incredible navigators, they're all bilingual, and they will provide free navigation for your entire journey, period. We also do a whole lot of other things and fund a lot of programs all across the country, but this is the most important and this is the focus and this will come into play later in the presentation when I talk about what we've done as a sort of reaction to everything going on uh, in the media. We've helped 2.5 million people thus far, and we're gonna help more people in 2013 than we did in 2012. People like these three young kids who see this as a platform to get involved to honor their grandfather and his memory. Live Strong and the foundation is a platform for people who wanna make a difference and wanna support others who unfortunately are gonna come and face the same path into the future. So we're also very honored that we have the highest rating from the organizations you see on that slide, the watchdog agencies, the watchdog groups. And I'm not telling you this to sort of you know, promote our organization, I'm telling you this to give you context for those first few screenshots of those tweets and what we're gonna talk about next. So 15 years the organization's been around, great direct service programs, focused on survivorship, focused on the needs of individuals and their families with cancer, and rated extremely highly from some of the top organizations that, that focus on the social sector. So in January, we had, as an organization, six days to prepare for the interview that Lance Armstrong was gonna do with Oprah Winfrey. Just think about it, six days gets announced to the world that next week, exclusive interview with Lance Armstrong and Oprah Winfrey. You can imagine what our office was like. Our office, for those of you who don't know, is about 10 blocks from here. 
uh, in an old warehouse in East Austin. Come by and visit anytime if you'd like. Um, and we were faced with this idea or this, this, this task. What are we going to do? How are we going to react? And we made a decision early on to do a few key things. One, to be totally transparent and direct about the situation. Two, to be sort of over communicative and out there talking about it. We were not going to hide. We were not going to go into a bunker, which many groups do, and that serves them well. We chose not to do that. We were not going to be afraid of the situation and run from it. And the other thing we chose to do is we chose to frame this in terms of our own mission. So how ironic is this? We spend every single hour of every single day helping people with what we call survivorship. What are the tools and information that people need to survive a life-threatening, horrific experience that we call cancer? And now we were thinking, okay, wait a minute, we got to apply those same tools, that same philosophy, to our own organization. This is what we do. So we decided to be totally open, totally transparent, totally direct, and really take it head on, which was by far the harder path to go. And I will tell you personally and professionally, the harder path to go. So what did we do? As soon as the Oprah interview aired, we put out this statement. We expressed our disappointment with the situation surrounding our founder, and at the same time, we expressed our gratitude for his founding of the organization, his financial support, his time and energy, and everything he's done to make this possible. We issued this while the program was airing that night so that we could get ahead of sort of the media storm that was going to ensue. The next day, we put this graphic up on Facebook. And it was, for us, the most shared graphic within such a short period of time. Movements, social movements, are started by individuals. And successful social movements always expand beyond the individual. Otherwise, they don't succeed. This was not a, a, a slap at Lance Armstrong. Quite the opposite. This was a movement had been created, and millions of people affected by cancer are counting on the support and programs and the organization. So these were two of the first examples of things we did. Next, what we decided was, wait a minute, most organizations that go through crisis have a serious flaw. They either have bad products and programs, they have financial crisis, or they have sort of not adequate people or not the right people. There's some issue. And what we realized when we looked internally is we said, wait a minute, we've got great programs, we've got great partners, and we've got incredible people. How can we highlight those things, and how can we redirect the conversation to make sure people understand who we are and what we do? So we decided to focus on the people we serve. So these are some of the graphics that we immediately started putting out. These are individuals who have personally benefited from the foundation. We started putting these out on social platforms. We started actually doing some print media. We started leading everything we did from a communications and marketing standpoint with the people we serve. Now, that may sound like uh, a no-brainer, but it was amazing how quickly our team got focused on it. Let's talk about the people we serve. Let them talk about the services they've received. Let them tell their own story. And there's no more powerful thing you could do than have individuals who've benefited from your services tell their story. Sarah is one example. And this is her daughter, Lily. Maybe one of the, the more powerful examples that we had recently of someone who reached out and was served by the organization. Um, and in order to sort of highlight how impactful these stories are, I'm going to show you just a short uh, video clip of Sarah's story. When you get a second diagnosis of breast cancer, all of the hopes and dreams that you had for your life and getting beyond cancer just sort of end at that moment. I had had cancer about five years before I found the lump, so I was really surprised when it came back. My husband and I were getting ready to start a family. We were so excited about our future, bought a new house and had a dog, and we were ready 
my best chance for surviving long term was to have my ovaries removed. I thought that becoming a mom wasn't going to be a possibility anymore. I went to see my oncologist. She told me doing IVF for in vitro fertilization was an option. We started to get a little hopeful. She connected us with Livestrong. We worked with the Navigator to help pay for the medications and services for freezing embryos. And during that time, my sister-in-law, Lisa, had a dream that she carried our baby for us. She came forward and said, I'm gonna do this for you. She knew how important it was for us to be parents. So she stepped up and offered. And nine months later, Lily D was born. I love being a mom and having a family and it gives me something to think about other than cancer. Even though, you know, there's late nights and little sleep, you just kind of forget about those things. Live Strong made what we thought was impossible possible. So we have so many stories just like Sarah's. And the idea was we had to just share those in a more direct uh, way because you can't get more powerful than having third party sort of validation. People didn't want to hear us talk about our services and programs. People wanted to hear those who benefited from them. And so we decided to do that in a much more dramatic way. So this is just a screenshot of something we shared on Facebook around Sarah's story. And if, you know, the, the numbers are real small at the bottom, but you know, at the time that this screenshot was taken, over five million people had seen this post. And you know, it's things like this that we did early on in this process to start to change the dialogue, to start to separate the issues. The drama in the cycling world has nothing to do, nothing to do with the work of the foundation helping people like Sarah. And it was incumbent upon us to try to separate those things in our communications and in the way that we reached out to people. And we are continuing to do that today. So that's how we focused on programs and direct services. I mentioned partners. We're so fortunate to have so many great partners. And so many great partners beyond what you see on this slide. Programmatic partners like the YMCA, like the cancer support community, uh, like the American Cancer Society. I mean, we work with so many different groups. On the cause marketing and corporate licensing side, some of our partners are, are listed on the screen in front of you. So we went to our partners and we said, right now, more than ever, we need you to focus your marketing, focus your messaging, and make sure we can tell and communicate effectively who we are and what we do. Because that's the differentiator. That's what we needed. And I'll give you just two examples. We entered into a partnership several years ago, uh, a, a very innovative partnership with a company called Demand Media. And we licensed them a URL, livestrong.com, and asked them to create a health and wellness website which they did. And there's been confusion in the market about the website versus the foundation's website. And it's been a work in progress for many months. But as soon as we realized there was such confusion, we went to our partners at Demand and we said, listen, we need you to retool the whole navigation of the site. We need you to make it so crystal clear the difference between this site and the foundation and how you're driving traffic to the foundation and where people can get support if they're diagnosed with cancer. And they immediately sprung into action. And the site has been totally redone. And it's incredible. So they stepped up in a big way at a time when we really, really needed them. The other example is Nike. Nike has been one of our best partners for many, many years. They just recommitted to another two-year partnership with the organization, which we're so grateful for. But what you see here on the screen is the new Nike campaign around the Livestrong partnership. These are pictures of individuals who have been impacted by cancer and who have been helped by the foundation. Those photos were actually shot by our organization at one of our events last fall. We pitched Nike this idea of take everyday survivors. Use everyday survivors in your campaign. So if you go it into retail in the coming two or three weeks, this is the imagery you're going to see. And it may, it may be the first time that Nike has done a marketing campaign without athletes without a professional athlete. 
And so we're super excited about this because it focuses the message on the cause, not simply just the brand. And we're gonna to continue to rely heavily uh, on our partners going forward. So where are we today? We talked about our programs, we talked about uh, our partners. Um, we, as I said earlier, we are still in the middle of this. And, and the hard part about it is, you don't know how long this process is gonna last. There's no playbook, there's no way to know how long this is gonna last. So we're gonna to continue to do the things we just talked about, and we're in a little bit of a different place. This is the same individual from Charity Navigator who I quoted earlier who said, it will just devastate them. Who's now saying things like, we hear so many great things about services and programs they provide. So I hope they learn from this and that they do survive. So things have started to change. People have started to make that separation. If you track things on social, you'll see that people are making the separation. People are saying, gosh, I really hope that the organization, that the foundation, that the mission does not suffer because of any of this other stuff. So we're an organization that uh, has had a lot of marks. We've had a lot of logos. We've had a lot of icons. Um, many of you are most familiar with the wristband, and, and that led us to lead with Livestrong as our brand. But we just, two weeks ago, announced uh, a new mark, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about it. For some, it may seem a little bit nuanced, but there's two really important aspects to this mark. One is, we are not walking away from the color yellow. Any of you who've gone through a situation like we're going through know that when you're in it, you start to receive tons of advice, both solicited and unsolicited. The emails just pour in. You should do this, you should do that. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And it's awesome, because it really does make you think. One of the topics that's come up the most is, are you going to stay with the color yellow? And we talked about it a lot, and we decided emphatically that we were. We've led with yellow for the last eight or nine years. In the cancer community, we're known by that color. It's an energetic, optimistic, hopeful color, and we're not gonna walk away from it. We're actually gonna lean into it even more aggressively. The other difference in the mark is the word foundation, which may seem nuanced. But everybody knows the brand Livestrong. What they don't know is the entity. And there's a difference. There's a difference between the brand and the entity. And by putting the word foundation there and by making the word foundation the same size as the word Livestrong, we're emphasizing that difference. Because if you go into a store and you buy a Nike t-shirt that says Livestrong, you need to know that that purchase is benefiting the foundation. And that foundation is what's operating the programs and services for people with cancer. So this just launched two weeks ago and we're gonna push this uh, pretty heavily in the coming weeks. The other thing we're gonna do is we are going to double down on our investment in our programs and services. We're not gonna retreat. Everybody says, oh, are you cutting back? No. In fact, we're gonna spend more on programs this year and we're gonna serve more people this year than we ever have in our history. That is what we are all about. We are not in the business of raising money. We're in the business of serving individuals and families and having the biggest impact possible in the cancer community. So people like Iram, who you see here, who as, a, as an example, won the Beaumont Marathon this weekend, pushing his daughter. Great article in the Austin American Statesman this morning about Iram, a uh, brain cancer survivor. People like Lori had cancer three times, one of our largest fundraisers and supporters, continues to battle today. We are going to continue to serve more people just like Lori. Tomorrow, we launch the next round of our community impact project, one of the most innovative things we do. We find programs that are working in communities, we evaluate them to make sure they're effective, and then we open it up to the whole country and say, do you want one of these programs in your community? We get hundreds of applications, we screen them, divide them by region, and we put them online tomorrow, and you can vote to have these programs implemented in your community. The long-term sustainability of these programs is 82% post our funding, because people like you and many others vote. Last year we had 400,000 people vote. They vote to bring programs to communities like Tampa, Florida, or Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 
and then they sustain because that community sustains the program that they're so vested in. So starting tomorrow, we'll announce $1.2 million in new grants that you can vote for online to bring to communities all across the country. And earlier I said that we realized we had three huge assets, programs, partners, and people. The images you see are some of the people that I get to work with every day. They put me to shame. Most of them have master's degrees. They make me look like the biggest lightweight in comparison. They are experts in their field. They're social workers, PhDs in evaluation and research, masters in public policy, MBAs, you name it, law degrees. One of the things we did when we heard about this interview, and we had six days to prepare, is we set up a camera in our office the morning after the Oprah Winfrey interview. And we interviewed our team members, our biggest asset, the people who go to work every single day to make a difference in people's lives. And we asked them to talk about why they do it, and talk about the organization, and talk about the mission. And I want to show you a short video clip that we shared after we taped this. The heart and soul of Livestrong is the people. I mean, the people that work here, the people that volunteer, the people that donate, the people that are served. I mean, this is all about people. At the Livestrong Foundation, we have PhDs. We have social workers here who are literally on the front lines when you're diagnosed. People who crunch the numbers, people who understand the data. But more importantly, they're passionate about what they do. There's no other company, group, organization out there that does the work we do, and that is being an immediate and effective resource for people affected by cancer. All of the services that we provide at the foundation are free. It is no cost to the survivor or to their family member. If you were diagnosed with cancer today, you can call Livestrong right now. You'll be able to talk to an actual human being that can get you help. I was diagnosed 15 years ago with cancer, and at that time, there was nothing like this out there. We really take a very personalized approach in talking with them and understanding exactly the emotions that they're going through, what their experience is like. We become the place that you can come to as a reference, and either we'll provide you with that directly, or we will find the organization or the people who can offer that to you. Services like banking sperm or freezing eggs, we will be that person to talk to if you just need emotional support. I've seen firsthand how powerful our guidebook can be in helping somebody to navigate cancer. We're not about the disease, we're about the people that are fighting the disease, and those people are really important. Everything that we produce or, or develop programmatically is in response to a need that we've heard from a patient or survivor in their family. We just launched this new transportation program here in Austin, which is a direct response to a great need. We are very conscious of the money that's coming in and we spend it very wisely. We are very proud of the fact that 82 cents of every dollar go to programs for cancer survivors, their families, friends, and healthcare providers. We do that by asking tough questions, looking at the details. We really are um, stretching those resources and making the most of every single dollar that comes in the store. I think in general we all have an obligation to give back in some way and then when you get more specific and say well you're a cancer survivor or you've been touched by the disease I think there is an obligation to do something. I wanted to be a part of Livestrong because I lost my mother to cancer. Cancer took my grandfather when I was seven. I'm a three-time thyroid cancer survivor. I am a melanoma survivor. About four and a half years ago my mother passed away from ovarian cancer. I've lost my grandmother to cancer. My father is a survivor um, of almost 33 years. I'm a three-time cancer survivor. I've been living with prostate cancer for nine years. I've lost four family members to cancer. I'm a 20-year cancer survivor. That personal connection really drives my passion and my, my purpose for being here at the foundation. I don't think um, I ever would have spent nine years at one place if it wasn't something that I believed in. I believe we can improve technology to make a, a bigger difference in the way patients receive care. I believe that this foundation can change the way the world fights cancer. I believe our opportunities are greater today than have ever been in the history of this foundation. I truly believe that there's a need for us and we're making a difference. I believe that our navigation services help people every day. We all put everything that we have into this place every single day and it's nice when you leave that you feel like you've actually accomplished something. So this was another example of trying to capture in an authentic, transparent way 
what people do and why they do it. And as I said earlier, this has been an incredibly challenging time personally and professionally for all of us. Whether you work at the organization, whether you're a volunteer, whether you're a donor, partner, everybody has gone through such a tough experience. And yet, it pales in comparison to the experience of being diagnosed with cancer. It pales. The people we hear from every day who don't know where to go, don't know where to turn, who don't know what the future holds, those are real problems. Those are real challenges. And we're fortunate to work with such great people who are focused on them. I've said this before, and I'll say it again here. The biggest frustration for me during the last two years, maybe three years, has been that the individuals who you just heard from, that their credibility has been called into question for something that had nothing to do with them. Their credibility has been called into question in the media, by journalists, by others, as a result of something that had nothing to do with them. They are some of the finest human beings on the earth. And I'm privileged to get to spend so much time with them. But it hasn't been easy for anybody. And it's not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging for the next few months, maybe the next year or two. But those people you just heard from are so committed and so passionate. And without them, without the programs, without the partners, and without the people, we wouldn't be in the position we are today. And the position we're in today is that there is so much potential ahead of us. The future looks incredibly, incredibly bright. So I'm going to ask you to just indulge me for one second. If you're in the room and you've had cancer and survived cancer, can you stand up? And remain standing for a second? If somebody in your family has survived cancer, can you stand up? If you've lost somebody in your family to cancer, can you stand up? Look around the room. One in two men and one in three women will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. That is why we exist. And that is why when we get asked the question all the time, will you survive? Will the organization survive? The answer is a resounding yes. Thank you for doing that. The answer is yes, because there are too many people to serve. The market is unfortunately growing. So my only request uh, of you today, since everybody's on their device, I can see, put this phone number and put this URL in your device. Put it in your contacts. Because in the next week, or two, or three, or four, I can assure you that everyone here is going to hear from someone who says, I'm so sorry to tell you, but I've been diagnosed with cancer. And the one request I have is direct them to us as soon as possible. Because the quicker we can get in touch, the more we can do to ease their path and improve their quality of life into the future. Help them navigate that journey through free one-on-one -on -one support. So with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you for your uh, time and attention. And I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. And again, there's a microphone uh, in the second row there. Thank you so much. While many people in the organization that deal with this, you as the CEO deal with it in a different way. How did you, as the head, wrestle with this, and what special things did you have to do to lead your organization through this? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, one of the things that we do as an organization, we're small enough that we have, you know, we all work in one office in Austin, Texas. Uh, we have 105 people. And so that enables us to get everybody together on a regular basis. So typically, normal operating sort of procedures, we only have those team meetings once a month. Um, during the last few months, we've had I mean, once or twice a week. Every time something was happening, we'd get everybody together and we would just share 
and, and open it up for questions and be really transparent about what was going on. Um, I will tell you personally that um, when this all started a few months ago, uh, it was very difficult for me um, because I didn't feel like I had the time to really process and think about everything. There were so many decisions to be made and so many things every single day that I didn't have a chance to sort of step back and, and really think through uh, everything that had just taken place. Um, but uh, it's been challenging. I mean, the, the only thing I can, I can say is that for about a week in the fall, I went through a period where I like, totally changed my normal routine, which was awful. I mean, I wasn't exercising, I wasn't eating well, I wasn't sleeping well, and all those things that you sort of stop doing. And then, fortunately, my wife, uh, one night, this is actually funny, she, she, she's Googling, and she's, she Googles stress. And if you Google stress, one of the first sites that comes up is the Mayo Clinic. And there are nine clinical symptoms of stress. And she's like reading through, and she's like, one, two, three, four, five, six. She gets to the bottom and she goes, well, I'm not sure, but I think you have eight of them. And, um, but it's all the things you would think, right? You, you stop exercising, you don't eat well, then you don't sleep, and then it just becomes this sort of cycle. So for me, personally, the biggest thing is just keeping to exercise and eating well and sleeping. Because if you don't do those three things, it's hard to function and it's hard to make sort of clear-headed decisions. I just had a question, you know, I kind of compare this to, in a way, kind of what Penn State went to, went through with Joe Pa leaving and immediately they took on the statue and uh, kind of separated themselves from Joe Paterno. Do you find yourself still trying to keep away from Lance or you, like what is your, what is your, good question. Uh, you know, association with him now? Yeah, so How obviously, um, great question. So. Um, Obviously, last fall, Lance resigned from our board, so he's no longer on the board um, and no longer has any uh, you know, official affiliation. Um, but I will tell you this, he um, is a very good friend of mine, very close friend of mine. Um, he uh, apologized to me personally and apologized to our whole staff, and we decided that we were gonna accept his apology and in order for the organization to go forward. Um, and, and I will also say that personally I'm grateful that he asked me 12 years ago to come down here and, and help this organization because I get to do what I love every day and I think we have a tremendous opportunity. Um, and the fact is he's our founder, he's our single biggest donor, and we as an organization wouldn't be in this position had he not decided to start the organization at the age of 26. So. Um, it's a little bit nuanced compared to the Penn State situation because there's the personal and professional, um, but I hope that answers your question. Hi, I work at a nonprofit that deals with some hard-hitting, almost controversial issues. There's a lot of um, haters out there and all of that, and so how do you and your staff and particularly your communications people uh, prevent or stop yourselves from coming off as really defensive? That is a great question. And um, I should have used this answer for the first gentleman's question. Because um, there, we have a lot of haters in our sort of universe as well. And probably the thing that improved my personal quality of life the most over the last year was to stop reading what they say. I mean, I know that sounds sort of simple. But what we realized very maybe early on was that this small group of haters were talking to each other. And we monitored what they were saying, and we monitored who they were communicating with, and they were literally talking to each other. And when we found that out, it became way less important to read what they were saying, follow what they were saying. And, and I think, uh, my colleagues would know better, but it just improved our quality of life. Because we aren't gonna convert them. But there are millions of other people who need our services and support, and we chose to focus on you know, our energy over there. Um, but just like those tweets I showed earlier, I mean, when I was getting up in the morning, and I mean, just personal attacks on our staff and our team, and you know, things that are just so detrimental to how you operate on a daily basis. So we, once we, once we decided or, or figured out that they were talking to each other, we just decided to, to move on. 
Early in your remarks, you said um, we got these tweets from people who didn't understand us, didn't know our mission, knew nothing about us. For an organization that's 15 years old, do you think this crisis pointed out a flaw in your brand strategy up until this point? Great question. Um, I don't know if it's a flaw, but, but, I'll, but, uh, but yes. So the challenge for us has always been, and, th and this experience is actually making us so much better at how effectively we communicate. The challenge has always been for us that you know, Live Strong, the brand, was created out of focus groups with survivors. We were trying to name a program, and we had these focus groups, and went through iteration after iteration, and finally we got to this place where we came up with, with Livestrong. So there's such ownership sort of felt by the community of survivors over the brand, which is great. The challenge was that as the brand grew, the brand became so much bigger than the organization. And I think if we went back in time, eight or nine years ago, we would structure our communications and marketing differently. Because the brand became so ubiquitous, and yet, so when you ask people now, do you know of Livestrong? They say yes. Do you know what they do? They'll say cancer. Well, do you know specifically what they do? No. And so, on the one hand, it's great that we have this amazing brand, but on the other hand, it's been hard to penetrate with the specifics of who we are and what we do. And this last few months has made that way more clear for us, and the team is way more focused now on sort of what's the message and how do we sort of hammer the same message over and over again. So whether it's a flaw or, or yes, there, there's been a challenge over time. And the hard part is I don't know if I would trade. Because it is great to have this, this brand, not so great to have an issue where people don't, don't understand it. And that, that, quite frankly, that's the opportunity. That's the huge opportunity for us right now because when we do research and we ask people, you know, do you know the brand? They say yes. Do you know cancer? Yes. What do they do? And if they don't know, when we feed them, did you know they do this? Then the affinity for the brand is sort of off the charts. Okay. And so that's the challenge and the opportunity. But yeah, we, I, would have, I think we would have done things differently years ago to mitigate that if we knew how big the brand would get. So it's sort of hard to, hindsight's 2020. <laughs> Thanks. So I have a quick comment first. Uh, a few weeks ago, I got an email from Livestrong and said that my uh, credit card had expired. So I had to call and, and uh, you know, and, and, and uh, change the number so my donation would go through. So when I Thank you. called back, I doubled it because I believe in what you guys are doing regardless of everything else that's going on. Thank you um, very much. So on that note, I don't want to make you live in the past, but I think it's fascinating to think about this from a standpoint of how do individual employees in an organization deal with this uh, sort of thing when it happens. So if you could talk a bit about the day that Lance came in and apologized to everybody. Um, some of the reports in the media said that he cried and people within the building were crying. What was the reaction of, say, the first few employees that you talked to after he was done speaking? Um, and, and, and how long did it take you just to put that behind you and then get back to work, which is what you've talked about mostly here today? Yeah, great question. A um, few things. One, I think through this experience, what I've learned is that you know, everybody, every one of us processes things differently. And my hypothesis is even now, our 105 team members, people are still processing things differently. You know, I mean, we saw differences in terms of, you know, this happened a lot of this in October, then we had a break for Thanksgiving, then we had sort of break for the holidays in the winter, then January, so like, there have been these sort of pockets of time where people have had more time to sort of be with their family and friends and sort of process things. Um, that day specifically, uh, it was a Monday morning. Um, our team did not know what the meeting was about. Um, they soon realized because the, the media attention was so great outside of our office that we had to cover the walls with paper so that when we went into our conference room, people wouldn't see who was in there. Um, so I think when our team walked into the room and saw that there was paper on the walls, they knew, they knew something was up. Um, when Lance walked into the room, people uh, clapped. Um, most people hadn't seen him in a few weeks or months. Um, so that was the initial reaction. 
as someone that's known him for 12 years, um, I've never seen him as emotional. Um, I was standing next to him and he was uh, visibly shaking. Um, and my guess is that, that doing that was one of, if not the hardest things he's done. Um, the reaction was, as you might imagine, with 100 people, very different. I mean, you sort of look at people's faces and you just sort of see different emotions. Um, I think some people were sad, some people were relieved, some people were exhausted, some people, I mean, it's just sort of all over the map. And I think that's started this processing that for some people may take months. Um, but we have a, a, again, you talk about resilience, I mean, we have a great, very resilient group of people, many of whom, again, have experienced cancer. They've experienced things that, as big as this is, just doesn't compare when you've, when you've been told you have this disease. So um, yeah, I'm proud of our team, really proud of our team. Thank you for your support, <laughs> means a lot. Um, thank you for, for being here and giving this talk. I'm trying to work something through. I can't really imagine what it would be like to have uh, such a close friend who had helped an organization and who I had witnessed help so many people and done so many good things, also do some very bad things that also caused a lot of real harm to a lot of people. And I was a bit surprised that you opened your talk with criticism of journalists, people you referred to as so-called journalists, um, and accused them of bastardizing your brand. And I, I was stewing and I figured I should actually honestly <laughs> yeah, totally. comment because I thought, I think there was actually another individual who bastardized your brand. I'm, I'm sympathetic to, and actually, I, I get and agree with your argument that, that his lying and his cheating is not related to the good work that your organization does. Right. But the brand was built up on his reputation. And so that's real, isn't it? I mean, it, and I wonder if you're... Sure. I wouldn't expect you to turn your back on your friend. Like, like, that wouldn't be the right thing to do either. But do you think some of that anger that you're directing towards journalists is maybe misdirected or? Well, so here's what I would say. So I, I, I wouldn't direct any anger to anyone who is critical of Lance the Cyclist. That wasn't my point. My point was those tweets were using our brand, the brand of the foundation, the brand we own, the brand we created through these focus groups with survivors. And so if, if, if they want to tweet about Lance Armstrong and you know, he lied and he did this and he did that, like, I'm not going to say a word. I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to defend any of that. But it, was, it, it just was offensive to us that they chose to use things like lie strong or you know, things like that. that because, because there are people with cancer for whom and I'm one of them, that, for whom that brand is just so meaningful and so significant. And, and so if you want to be critical of him, hey, I'm not, again, I'm not, that's, not my, that's not my area, and, and I'm not going to defend that. Um, but I think it was just the use of our brand. Because, because from our vantage point, as intertwined as they were, we see that brand as the foundation's brand. And that may be just the way we look at it, and because we're so sort of in it every day. Um, but uh, but I, I, I would hope that journalists in the future would give the organization a fair shake and really look at who we are and what we do as opposed to you know, only sort of um, comparing or relating it to you know, uh, simply our founder. So that was the point, but thank you. Good question, thank you. Hi, thanks Hi. for being here today. Um, you talked about that you had six days to prepare the public response um, to Lance's interview, but can you speak for a moment about the donor communications, and did you have donors immediately pull out that you had to bring back in? 
What was the strategy or how did it differ from the public response and handling for donor communications? Great, great question. And I should have mentioned this. So um, we did a lot of communication to a lot of different audiences. So whether it was a mass email to our whole database or whether it was targeted sort of emails to what we call our friends and family, which is sort of a, a group of about 1,000 people. Um, so we, we were over communicating with all of them. Um, the way our organization works is we raise about a third of our money from individuals, about a third of our money from events, and a third of our money from corporate partners. And so we have very diverse sort of audiences. Um, so we tried to communicate with all of them as, as best we could, a lot of phone calls, um, a lot of thank you cards written, a lot of you know just handwritten stuff. Um, the, the hard part is that what we've seen is that if a donor is backing out, most of the time they don't let you know. So it's still in some regards too early to tell. Because we had these spikes last year. Every time we were in the news, people would double down or people would give more and that was unbelievable and it was so you know, great for our organization. But you don't always hear from the person who's not gonna give $50 this year. And so it may take months for us to sort of see what the impact of that is. Um, <clears throat> the core supporters have been just over the top. People saying, I'm going to give more, I'm going to raise more, I, I just don't want to see the organization hurt. Um, but there will be some fallout, and it's just hard to know right now. One of the things we've tried to do with our team is to say, we can't look at the data every day because it doesn't give you a real picture of any trends. So we, we've got to probably get another month to two months of data before we can really see what's going on. And I'm not going to stand here and say, I expect things to be up. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be a challenge. But, um, but over communicating, whether it's internally or externally with various groups, is, is so important. Um, I will tell you, we also brought in a, a, a consultant recently to help us for a day or two on stewardship, uh, which is something we pride ourselves on. Um, we do, I mean, I think we do about 800 handwritten notes a week. <clears throat> so, but we brought in a woman who's a stewardship expert uh, from New York who um, was just wonderful and had so many great ideas and, and, and it was just interesting to hear sort of her perspective. Um, but that's obviously, communicating with donors is super critical. Well, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Hi, my name's Lauren. I work in PR, and as somebody who has yet to have a lot of experience in the crisis communication <laughs> area, I, um, I hear you say the importance of over-communicating, but I'm kind of hungry to hear your top three or five lessons learned, key points um, to successfully navigating something like what you went through. So for us, they would be um, transparency, whether again, internal or external, mm -hmm. just to tell people what's going on. Here's what's going on, the good and the bad, and just be open about it. Um, the second would be this idea that we are gonna talk about it. I mean, like, as an example, being here today, people say, oh, really, you're gonna go talk about this? We have a moment in time right now where people are paying attention, and we would be foolish to not take advantage of that. If one person leaves this room and helps get us in contact with somebody who has cancer and we serve them, it would have been worth it. And, and what we hear from groups that have advised us is most do the opposite. Most go and hide and they say, you know what, we're gonna reemerge in six or nine months. Well, in six or nine months, nobody's paying attention. And so as hard as it is to do these things and to talk about things that are very personal and very emotional, it's the right thing for the mission and the organization. And so I think the third thing is every decision we make is through the filter of, is it in the best interest of the mission? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is yes, then we do it. And it sounds easier than it is, but, um, but I think those are some of the things we've learned. And, and the other thing, that the advice I've gotten from a lot of people is you can't be paralyzed. And a lot of organizations and individuals get paralyzed because they've got too much data coming at them, they've got too many people giving them advice, they've got too, and they're just like, I don't know what to do. And we had some of that early on, like just, but you got to just make decisions, and whatever you do, keep going down that path. And how was it, I'm sorry if you said it already, that you released a statement and put something out when you were saying that brands often fall silent or um, kind of go off of the radar? 
I'm sorry, what was it? I was curious how long it was before Livestrong issued a statement. We issued a statement while the Oprah interview was airing. Okay. I mean, before it even ended. Um, because otherwise we would have just been inundated. Right. And we just said, we gotta get ahead of this. We gotta, we gotta be out there. Great, thank you. Thanks. Okay, this is the last question, okay. so I'll try to be fast. Um, hi, my name is Jennifer Smith, and I'm responsible for Michelin Brand Communications, and I applaud you for being here today. I have a question from the brand management perspective. You had said that you just recently relaunched the brand for Livestrong Foundation. Had you started that work before the crisis? Yeah. And, and in answering the question, if you can address at all, if you talked about losing the strong part of it because of the <laughs> affiliation with his last name and you know kind of how you landed on where you landed and if you changed things as a result of the crisis. Sure, great question. So um, the answer to your first question is yes. We had been working on that project for at least 18 months okay. because we had research from 24 months ago showing that there was confusion in the consumer market. Mm -hmm. If somebody was buying a Livestrong product was the money also going to Livestrong? Where was the money going? What was the entity behind it? And so that's where that sort of word foundation came into play. So we had been working on that for a long time. Um, the interesting thing is that, and I know it's hard to believe from where we stand today, but the interesting thing is that when the Livestrong brand was created through these focus groups, it had nothing to do with his name. Mm. In other words, we so have- make that association. Yeah, so like, well, okay. well, well, I mean, we do now because it's, yeah. Sort of, that's what people think. But, but if you go back and you read the transcripts of these focus groups and these word association exercises that this firm in town did for us with the survivors, um, it never came up. Interesting. And in fact, the, the reason we picked Livestrong early on was because there was so much tension in the focus groups about the brand. Half the people in the room said, that's what I aspire to do, and that's sort of what I want. And the other half said, don't tell me how to live. Don't project your values on me. And our board met, this was years ago, and they said, look, that's what you want. You want like, the fact that people are so passionate about it that they're talking about it. So we didn't, we didn't talk about losing the strong part at all. I will tell you that one piece of unsolicited advice I got from somebody was that we should flip the bolding, make the live bold and the strong not bold. Mm -hmm. So you know, again, lots of ideas coming in, but, um, but it was a process that we started almost two years ago, um, and uh, so it was a long, long sort of process. Got it, thank you. Thank you very much.